But God was not yet ready to throw in the towel. Realizing that he needed man's invitation to get back into the earth, God immediately went back to work. After thousands of years, God finally found a man named Abraham, who took the bait and became the vehicle through which God, if he was lucky, might one day win back the world he had lost. Adam, as I said, gave it away to the serpent, to the devil. As a result of it, he got his behind kicked out of the garden. He was out of Eden, out of the garden, and began to wander around. And he has troubles from day one. Now, God was out of the business. God was out of the earth realm. God had no more stock in this earth realm. No more, none at all, nothing he could do. Nothing he could do. Not a thing in the world he could do. The only way God could get back into this earth realm, he had to have an invitation. <laughs> he had to have an invitation. And so God looked around, saw different men, saw Noah, saw a different one. He gave them a few instructions. They did what he said, so and so and so and so. But finally he got to a point where he had his plan ready for an operation. And he saw a man named Abraham. Through Abraham, a second Adam would eventually come, who, if all went according to plan, would return to man his godhood and to God his good earth. Abraham could well have told God to just bug off. Instead, however, he decided to buy into God's deal. God and Abraham became blood brothers. They forged a covenant that would gain Abraham health and wealth and would regain for God a foothold into the world he had created. God's plan was to make Abraham the father of all nations and to produce from his seed another Adam who would regain the turf lost by the first Adam. In keeping with his word, God made Abraham very, very wealthy. Then once again, he proceeded to visualize. Through God's mind raced, images of a brand new Adam, a man who would one day restore to him his rightful place in the universe and would forever banish his arch rival Satan from the kingdom. And then it happened. One day, the image of a savior coalesced in God's mind. Without hesitation, God began speaking into existence the picture of a redeemer. He had that picture painted on the very canvas of his consciousness. Excitedly, God positively confessed, The Messiah is coming! The Messiah is coming! As God's spirit hovered over a woman named Mary, the confession began to take shape before his very eyes. The spoken words became legs, arms, eyes, and hair, and then there emerged the body of a second Adam. The Bible says the prophets came and spoke the word not knowing what they were saying. But 4,000 years passed when the word became a human being and walked and talked and moved. The spoken word became a human being. The spoken word became flesh. The spoken word got legs on, arms, eyes, hair, a body, and he was no longer saying, Thus saith the Lord. He was saying, I say unto you. Amen. The word that was spoken through the lip of prophets was now walking on the seashore of Galilee. The second Adam was named Jesus. As Abraham's descendant, Jesus was wealthy and prosperous. He lived in a big house. Jesus had a nice house, a big house. He handled big money. Jesus was handling big money. He even wore designer clothes. John 19 tells us that Jesus wore designer clothes. <laughs> Uh, well, what else are you going to call it? Now, let, uh, designer clothes, that's blasphemy. No, that's what we call them today. I mean, you didn't get the stuff he wore off the rack. It wasn't a one-size-fits-all deal. Uh-uh, uh-uh. No. No, this was custom stuff. Jesus was so wealthy that he needed a treasurer to keep track of all of his money. The Bible said that he had a treasurer, a treasury, they called it the bag, that they had one man who was the treasurer named Judas Iscariot, and the rascal was stealing out of the bag for th three and a half years, and nobody knew that he was stealing. You know why? Because there was so much in it, he couldn't tell, nobody could tell that anything was missing. If he had three oranges in the bottom of the bag and he stole two of them, don't tell me, you wouldn't know that something was missing. <laughs> Jesus, who was a whiz at speaking things into existence, showed his disciples how to master the art of positive confession too. Thus, 
they too enjoyed unlimited health and wealth. Some of his followers caught on so well that they became rich beyond comprehension. The Apostle Paul had so much money that government officials would work feverishly just to try to get a little bribe out of old Paul. You don't think these apostles didn't walk around with money. I mean, they had money. I'm just thank God that I saw this and gave up the denominational line and got on God's line before I starved me and all my family to death. Paul had the kind of money that people, <laughs> that government officials would, would block up justice to try to get a bribe out of old Paul. Jesus also overcame every single trick and temptation that Satan could throw his way, even though he never claimed to be God. We're still questioning what was said about that prophecy. That prophecy never mentioned the Son of God. Never said anything about the Son of God. What did it say? It said, I did not claim to be God. Mm -hmm. in, that's all it said. In, in other words, in so many words, you're right. Nowhere in the New Testament did he literally get Preach up and, and, claim and he was say, God. I am God, did he? Now, oh. I stand corrected. And the Christian attitude... Jesus succeeded in living a life of sinless perfection. When all was said and done, Jesus passed the test which the first Adam had failed. And then... In the prime of his life, Jesus entered a garden, a garden much like Eden, where the first Adam had lost his godhood. In this garden, however, a garden called Gethsemane, Jesus moved into the final stages of a process that would transform him from an immortal man to a satanic being and would in turn create men as little gods. God came from heaven, became a man, made man into little gods went back to heaven as a man. He faces the Father as a man. I face devils as the Son of God. You see what I'm talking about? You say, Benny Hinn, am I a little God? You're a son of God, aren't you? You're a child of God, aren't you? You're a daughter of God, aren't you? What, what else are you? Quit your nonsense. What else are you? If you say, I am, you're saying, I'm a part of him, right? Is he God? Are you his offspring? Are you his children? Yes. You can't be human. These gods would no longer be subject to the scourge of sin, sickness, and suffering. I have news for you. When you were born again, the Word was made flesh in you. And you became flesh of his flesh, bone of his bone. Don't tell me you have Jesus. You are everything he was and everything he is and ever shall be. And the new man doesn't look back, it has no past. It doesn't look ahead, it got no future. It says, I am as he is. That's what it says, as he is, so are we in this world. Jesus said, go in my name, go in my stead. Don't say I have, say I am, I am, I am, I am, I am. That's why you'll never, ever, ever, ever have to say I'm sick. How can you be sick if you're the new creation? As part of the process, Jesus would have to die a double death on the cross. He would have to die spiritually, and then he'd also have to die physically. Jesus had to go through that same spiritual death in order to pay the price. Now, it wasn't the physical death on the cross that paid the price for sin, because if it had been, any prophet of God that had died for the last couple of thousand years before that could have paid that price. It wasn't physical death. Anybody could do that. If physical death was enough... The two thieves on the cross could have atoned for the sins of mankind. No, the real key was spiritual death, suffering in hell. One day, upon a cruel cross, the crystal Christ, the paragon of virtue, was transformed into a defiled demoniac. Why did Jesus then on the cross say, my God? Because God was not his father anymore. He took upon himself the nature of Satan. The lamb became a serpent. He was ushered into the very bowels of the earth. There Christ was tortured by Satan and his minions. And all hell laughed. Satan was seated on his throne with a thickening grin on his face. His lip twisted in grotesque triumph. And all the imps of hell were dancing a jig. And the word came, we got him now. 
We've defeated the plan of God. And the devil was sitting there saying, I told you, if you'd follow me, I'd lead you to victory. We got him now. And they wrapped their grimy hands and the chains of hell itself around Jesus. And they consigned him to one of the cells in the Hades section of the underworld. And then Satan and his demon host went on a three-day drunk. They thought they had him. They had defeated and thwarted the plan of Almighty God. And Jesus sat there, as it were, immobile, not saying a word, not doing anything, except serving our sentence. Little did Satan know, however, that the last laugh was going to be on him. For just as Adam had fallen for Satan's trap in Eden, now Satan had fallen for God's trap in hell. You see, Satan had blown it on a technicality. He had dragged Christ into hell illegally. Satan had completely forgotten to consider that Jesus had not actually sinned. Jesus had merely become sin as a result of the sin of others. Alas, Satan and his demonic hosts had tortured the emaciated, poured out little wormy spirit of Christ without legal right. Oh, I'm telling you, Jesus is in the middle of that pit. He's suffering the very base end punishment. He is suffering all that there is to suffer. There is no suffering left on, apart from him. His emaciated, poured out, little, little wormy spirit is down in the bottom of that thing. And the devil thinks he's got him destroyed. But all of a sudden, God started talking. And when God starts talking, can't nobody get away from it. I mean, hell itself ain't far enough. It ain't deep enough and it ain't wide enough to keep the word of God from coming in there. This was exactly the opening God had been looking for. Seizing the moment God spoke his faith-filled words into the bowels of the earth, suddenly the twisted, death-wracked spirit of Jesus began to fill out and come back to life. He began to look like something the devil had never seen before. There, right in the sinister presence of evil itself, Jesus began to flex his spiritual muscle. As a horde of whimpering demons looked on, Jesus whipped the devil in his own backyard. He snatched Satan's keys and he emerged from hell as a born-again man. Why did he need to be begotten? or born because he became like we were separated from God because he tasted spiritual death for every man and his spirit and inner man went to hell in my place can't you see that physical death wouldn't remove your sins he's tasted death for every man He's talking about tasting spiritual death. Jesus is the first person that was ever born again. Why did his spirit need to be born again? Because it was estranged from God. God had pulled off the coup of the ages. Not only had he tricked Satan out of his lordship using Jesus as the bait, but he'd also caught Satan on a technicality through which Jesus could be born again. But that's not all. Because Jesus was recreated from a satanic being to an incarnation of God, you too, my friend, can become an incarnation. As much an incarnation as Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And as an incarnation, you can have unlimited health and unlimited wealth. A palace like the Taj Mahal with a Rolls Royce in your driveway. The whole point is I'm trying to get you to see, to get you out of this malaise of thinking that Jesus and the disciples were poor and then relating that to you, thinking that you as a child of God have to follow Jesus. The Bible says that he has left us an example that we should follow his steps. That's the reason why I drive a Rolls Royce. I'm following Jesus' steps. You are a little Messiah running around on earth. When you say, I'm a Christian, you're saying, I am Mashiach in the Hebrew. I'm a little Messiah walking on earth, in other words. All it takes now is to recognize that you are divinity. May I say it like this? You are a little God on earth running around. You too can harness the force of faith. Never again will you have to pray, thy will be done. When I first got saved, they didn't tell me I could do anything. They just, what they told me to do is that whenever I prayed, I should always say the will of the Lord be done. Now, doesn't that sound humble? It does. 
Sounds like humility. It's really stupidity. I mean, you know, you, you, really, we, we insult God. We do. We, we, we really insult him without even realizing it. If you have to say that, if it be thy will or thy will be done, if you have to say that, then you're calling God a fool. Your word is God's command. By using your tongue to release the force of faith, you can speak whatsoever you desire into existence. What do you need? I need money. Then start creating it. Start speaking about it. Start speaking it into being. Speak to your billfold. Say, you big, thick billfold full of money. Speak to your checkbook. Say, you checkbook, you've never been so prosperous since I owned you. You're just jammed full of money. You've got pain and disease in your body. Speak to your body. God will create the fruit of your lips. Say to your body, your whole body. Why, you just function so beautifully and so well. Why, body, you never have any problems. You're a strong, healthy body. Or speak to your leg, or speak to your foot, or speak to your neck, or speak to your back. And once you have spoken, believe that you've received, and don't go back on it. Speak to your wife, speak to your husband, speak to your circumstances, and speak faith to them, decree to them, and God will create what you're speaking.